Thank you. So the gill is dead, or that's what I pretend. <laughs> what do I mean by this sentence exactly? The gill, the global interpreter lock, it's, well, if you have been at the previous talk in this very room, you know already exactly what the global interpreter lock is. Well, I assume a lot of you do. If you don't, well, it is simply a lock that in in the, uh, in the C Python or PyPy implementation of Python, it is one global lock that needs to be acquired in order to run any Python code. So Python code can run only if it has a lock, which means if you are writing a, a Python program using multiple threads, and all these threads are trying to do some CPU-intensive computation, then actually only one of them will run at a time. This is the, the basic story. And this has been the case since, well, since forever, since 92 in CPython and forever in PyPy. So here I'm talking about PyPy. What is PyPy? PyPy is an al alternative implementation to, to the Python language. Uh, it was started 10 years ago. Uh, it has better performance most of the time because it has, uh, well, uh, just-in-time compiler built in. Mm -hmm. Try it, it's great. <laughs> now, STM means software transactional memory. What do I mean by that? Please see the part two of my talk. And now PyPy STM is an alternative to PyPy. So it means you need to use another version of PyPy. But this alternative does not have a built-in global interpreter lock. That's the point. So let's start with an example. This is the result of running, I, I ran it before on my laptop. So it is uh, Richards, which is some random benchmark, some CPU intensive benchmark. Um, here I run it like a, a total of 10,000 iterations, so divided in four threads. So here it's just naively using threads dot start new threads in order to create four threads. Each of these four threads runs for 2,500 iterations. Okay, and we see how much time it takes. This is the time, so 8.01 seconds is how long it takes on PyPy, the so regular PyPy, so with a gill. And without a gill, it takes only 2.5 seconds on this laptop, which is a 2 slash 4 core laptop. So it, it's good. This is an example where it works great, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so well, I mean, obviously, obviously, obviously such an example as Richard's well, if my goal was only to run four Richard's, exam four Richard's benchmark in parallel, then well, I could run four processors. That's kind of obvious. Uh, OK, and then if, if you are into running sub-process, then maybe you are, uh, you are already using this multiprocessing module in Python, which is basically just running sub-processors. So the advantage of running sub sub Python processors is that each process has its own global interpreter lock. So if you are not using, I mean, typically in this case, you are not using threads at all, so it does not matter. But then the, well, of course, the big drawback is that if you are running in different processors, then, then, well, your data needs to, well, you have different processors and you need to pass data around, which is, well, which can be hard. 
basically. You cannot, you, can, you cannot take an existing big and complicated program and just turn it into a multiprocessing program. That does not work, usually. So, uh, by, by opposition, uh, PyPy STM is about running multiple threads in one program, and well, the idea is that you have shared data, and you can use the shared data, which is both good and bad. So, here is an example where I want to look into the source code. So, this is an example where I create a random graph. So, it's about here, um, create my list of vertices. Then I have edges that are from a random vertex to another random vertex. And the goal here of this algorithm is to find the two points in this random graph which are as far, as far from each other as possible. So, I mean, which is a specific problem which I'm sure has, has complex, has, has uh, nice solutions from a graph theoretical perspective, but here, here it's really the, the most naive algorithm. I take one point, enumerate all other points that I can reach, etc. So, so it means really try from every single point to reach all other points. So this is a function that, that given one point, find the furthest point here. And here is how I yes, here is how I how I look for 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 the answer. For all starting point, I put in a queue the starting point and then I get the results from another queue, and my queue is this. So I get a point, I compute what is the furthest, and put the furthest back in a queue. And why, why am I talking about queues? Because, because well, I, mean, I want a multi-threaded program, so what do I do here? Yes, so I have a loop that starts some number of threads, and gets me two queues. This is mostly standard Python, right? If you ignore the fact that the queues are from the transactions module, you can think of them as queues from the queue module. It's standard Python. But the point is that if you run this in the standard Python, then you don't get any benefit from, from this multi-threaded, this multi-threaded, well, hacks, basically. Okay, well, here, here you do, basically, the, 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 the program is unable to be run on, in, on multiple threads in parallel. Well, or, or it should in theory, but alas, this particular example which I, which I draw, which I quickly did yesterday, does not actually show any huge speed ups. Too bad. <laughs> yes. I know it's a bad example, basically, but uh, as you seen before, and as we'll see afterwards, there are other examples that are larger programs, and for these larger programs, it seems to work better, which is good. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's... So basically, I'm going to assume that you trust me, <laughs> and I will show you now another l larger program in which I did the exact same transformation. Uh, yep. So, it, this is a program that was already around 2011, I think, where I did the, the same demo. So, it is a 3D renderer, entirely in Python, and the 0 0.9 is the number of images per second, because that's on CPython. Okay, it takes forever, basically, but you can see it's changing. And then, boom, then if I run it on PyPy, whoa, it's much faster. PyPy is great. This was the, the 2011 talk. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
But now, let's, think, let, let's run this render on multiple threads. That's the point of this talk here now. And you see that it's about twice as fast. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yes, so this is just a pure Python rendering system. It's it. You, you can see that it's not just calling OpenGL or whatever, because it's using cylindrical projection. See, there's a, there's a wall here. It's not a straight line. <laughs> just, just a random comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does, wh okay, now what does it mean if I ha have a multi threaded program in Python? Well, this is what, what it's, this is a, a summary of in normal Python, so C Python or PyPy without STM. This is a summary of what you can expect from a multiple threaded, from a multi threaded program. Uh, well, if you, well, you, you need to divide your threads in two categories. You have your, the threads that are doing input output, so they are typically typically blocked in some operating system call, like file.read or, or receiving from a socket or doing things like that. And you have, on the other hand, the kind of thread that is uh, CPU intensive, that wants to compute something. So the, in standard Python, with the GIL, Typically, you get this result. So, and you can have any number of threads doing I/O. That's fine. That works great. But you can have only one thread that's doing CPU-intensive computations at a time. Mm -hmm. So now, if you, if instead you're using PyPySTM, you get this slightly strange result. Well, you can have any number of input-output threads. Okay. And instead of one, you can have up to n threads that are doing CPU-intensive things, where the number n is actually compiled into the PyPy, the PyPy STM. So that, that means, for example, here I'm using a PyPy STM with n equal, n equal 4, I think, but, well, you can have one with n equal 8. Typically, typically you, you will get one with n equal is the number of cores or in, on your machine, or, or, well, I don't know, a number larger than the number of cores of your machine would work as well. But the, po the point, the, well, so far so good. However, the, 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 well, the problem with, this with the approach in PyPyStem is that only one thread at a time can be switching between these two modes. What does it mean? So, I have an example. Yep. This is a completely trivial example. I have my run thread, which with the print I commented out, it's purely computing things on the CPU. If I run this on PyPy STM, it will happily use four threads. Good. However, if I run this on PyPy STM, then things get slow again. Because, because each thread is trying to, to be the thread. Well, it's basically because each thread is switching from I need to compute stuff, like this line here, to I need to do input output, which is, which is that line here. So this is the main drawback, basically. This is a point to look for when you are using PyPySTM. You need to find and well fix, quote, quote, somehow this. And, 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 I mean, in, in general, yes, it, it can occur. For example, if, if this is doing some, comp some complicated computation, like rendering a, a web page or, or doing this kind of stuff, but, but then in the middle, you get a call to the logger to write the logs. So, well, 
in this situation, you need, you need to, to think and refactor your code, so that the call to the logger would be, would be moved somewhere else. So, this is, uh, to, to conclude the first part of my talk, this is PyPySTM, you get compatible with standard Python, well, as much as PyPy itself is compatible with standard Python. You get multi-threaded multi programs that happily run out of the box, and, uh, well, still a few bugs, but try it out. Now, I promised at the beginning that I would explain what STM actually means, software transactional memory. Well, what is a transaction? Well, let's look at it, let's look at it this way. You have a program and think about how the, the GIL, the global interpreter lock works in C Python, for example, or in PyPy. Uh, the GIL is acquired, then you run stuff, then you release the GIL. And, and when, uh, when you release the GIL, you do some input-output, maybe or maybe not, and then you reacquire the GIL. So one transaction, what, what I'm going to call a transaction, is the amount of time between the acquire the GIL and the next release the GIL. <coughs> Why is it called a transaction? Because that actually is very similar to database transactions. Why is it similar? Because, well, what is transactional about it is, is the complete memory, all your objects. You have to look at your, the complete memory used by your program and think this is the database. As, well, think about it as, as a regular database. What you have in a regular database is you, you start a transaction, you do some reads and you do some writes. As long as you do reads and writes, you have a consistent view. And at the end, you try to commit. And these commits may work or they may cause an abort. So it means the, the commit fails. The commit fails if someone else did in parallel another transaction and the, that other transaction happened to change the object that you have read. So this condition is exactly the same one as the one used in software transactional memory. <coughs> so, so this means that you run... So let me draw pictures in the air. <laughs> When you, when you have the normal C Python, you run one, one thread, then you pause it, then you run another thread, then you pause it, then you run again the first thread, and so on. And so with this transactional approach, instead, you start running both threads, one commits, okay, the other one continues, then the other one tries to commit, and then, it may either succeed in committing or fail if there was a conflict. And if there was no conflict, then you are happy. Then the two, th the two threads work as if they, were, they had been executed one after the other. And well, if there are conflicts, you are unhappy and you throw away the, what you did and you restart it. So, so w one difference with, with the standard transaction and system of database is that here the, the throwing away and retrying part is completely transparent. You don't see it at the, at the, at the Python level. <coughs> yes, so here is how it works under the hood. Maybe I will go a bit faster here. So basically during a transaction you flag all objects that you read and you record the list of all objects that you write and when you commit you, you, you save that list of objects that you wrote into some log. So there is a grown log. And, well, basically you have a, a, a relatively simple to describe algorithm to, to, to know that, that uh, well, to know if 
you have a conflict or not, which, which means basically if you have read an object that another transaction has written in parallel, so concurrently. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, as I said, about and retries are transparent, but that also means that that also means that you can do well. So the input output, like if if one thread is really trying to do input output, obviously, once you, once you do input output, you cannot be cancelled and retried. So one only one transaction can be flagged as now this transaction actually did input output, so this transaction here cannot abort anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And well, so everything that I described so far is basically something that 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 looks a bit like what Larry Hastings pr uh, previously explained in his talk to how how to make a Python interpreter actually not have a gill. However, this approach that I'm, that I'm using here, STM, is better, I think, than the approach of, of adding locks a bit everywhere, because it, it also allows, well, it, it allows another, another style of programming. What do I mean? I mean that, well, you know that there will be no switch to another thread, in the middle of a bytecode. But, but this, this you can actually add a small hack with Atomic. And with this, you can, make it, you can make sure that there is no switch to another thread in a larger region. So this, this actually gives an interesting model to, 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 to program with multiple threads. You can make programs that have actually large region. And these large region, just by saying with Atomic, you make sure that there is no possible, that there is no possible switch. Well, you make sure that this whole block of Python code runs in one transaction. So what it means is that you can have actually this kind of interface. Well, this is just a simple thread pool, right? You, you, add, you add some function that will be called later in another thread some, with some argument. You'd say tr.run, and then the, the function, the, the, all the functions that you have added are executed at that point in multiple threads. However, however this runs them with, with the atomic uh, context manager that I described before. So it means that it gives exactly the impression to the programmer that each of the functions has run completely serialized. So I mean, even for the various functions are run in parallel, the transactions, the transactions that are done here under the hood are each large enough to contain completely the, f the function calls, which, which has, well, which, which, it basically it gives, it gives an incredible model. It gives, it gives well, <laughs> yes, I'm a bit running out of time here. <laughs> but what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, is that this is a model that I think is kind of, the future of multi-threaded programming, at, at least, uh, at least if you don't, if you are fine with generally, the, the, I mean, if you are fine with not getting to the last, last ten percent of performance or something like that, this is a very nice model to program. I mean, the the, the my 3D, my 3D viewer that I did before. Uh, it's, it's just parallelized by, so you compute colon by colon, but each colon, you, compute, you send it to another thread, so you have a thread pool that computes colons, but each colon 
computation is done in a, with atomic block, which means all the logic to compute one column, even if the logic depends on some global variable or, or does things like it can do whatever, it will work. It will work the same way. You don't get any race at the level of Python. Okay. So, yes. And that's it. Mm -hmm. We have time for two questions, and then we must leave the room. So I will be outside afterwards. Just. Um, I think you, you worked around the effect uh, of the print statement, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, you cannot uh, make a rollback then. Yeah. Because you, uh, transactional memory uh, acts, as you said, on some, some memory matrix or whatever. But uh, when you have an effect like the mm -hmm. print statement, mm -hmm. you cannot roll back. Yes. But uh, Python has no effect system, something like that. So, so effects are not annotated. So how, how does uh, uh, the PyPy SDM know when, when it detects an effect, something which uh, ah, manipulates no. the out, outside world? Well, it's when, when the standard PyPy would release the, the GIL. Mm. At that point, you know that something strange is going to occur. Okay. I mean, that's not co the complete answer. I can give you a more precise answer, but that's roughly uh, when. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, the simple question, would you uh, merge the PyPy STM to the main STM branch some some day or the main PyPy branch? Uh, the PyPy STM because yes. I think it's uh, it's a branch of uh, yes. PyPy. Yes. So will it become the default in mm -hmm. PyPy some day or will it be always uh, two right. different branches? Excellent question. I don't know so far. Uh, um, I mean, I mean this this has a problem that it is between 25 and 40 percent slower on a single thread. So, so again, the same problem. So, I, I don't know, basically. But, well, here we are in PyPy, so it's possible to think about more advanced ways where the PyPy interpreter switch between codes and, I don't know, JIT compiled machine codes for the non-STM mode and for the STM mode or something. So, so it's possible that at some point it will be the case, yes. Thank you.